Hello, and welcome to episode 95 of Public Interest Podcast with your host, Jordan Cooper, where we interview politicians, activists, advocates, and others who seek to improve the state of the world. We are here today with Delegate Jeff Waldstreicher of District 18 in Montgomery County, Maryland. Jeff, how are you doing today? Good. Thank you for having me. Glad to have you. The first question I'd like to pose to you is what are you currently doing or what have you ever done to advance the public interest and why? Ah, good question, Jordan. Thank you. Uh, So I'm starting my third term in the Maryland House of Delegates. And in my first two terms, we talked a lot about big issues. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the things we did, I'm very proud of. So we ended the death penalty in Maryland. We passed marriage equality in our state. Um, We uh, significantly increased the minimum wage. And so um, there's a lot I'm proud of in terms of the the first two terms that I've served. Mm -hmm. I'm now in my third term. And with uh, many of the big things out of the way, I've started to think more deeply about how we can be better as a government and serve our constituents Mm -hmm. in a way that um, is closer to them, Mm -hmm. is more human. uh, And a lot of the work I've been doing recently involves those things. So what has been your role? You you said there have been some big picture items that happened in your first two terms, marriage equality, ending the death penalty. Uh, firearm regulation. Mm-hmm. What is it that, how is, how does it matter? What, you were in the legislature, you were a delegate. Why does it matter that you were there? What was your role in getting those pieces of legislation passed? Yeah, that's a great question. It's, the legislature is like any workplace. Mm-hmm. And I think people forget that. In any workplace, you have people taking on different roles within the team. Mm -hmm. Some people are the big idea folks, but Mm -hmm. maybe they're not as good at the details. Some people are the details, but maybe they're not um, great communicators. And Mm -hmm. some people are great communicators, but maybe they're not as good at project management. So um, the the legislature is very much a workplace, and everyone fills roles within that workplace. How do your, if you don't mind, how do how do your colleagues view you as? You mentioned a communicator, a big picture idea, yep. detail. How do your colleagues view you? Yeah, I would say my colleagues probably view me as I like to view me, which is the detail guy. Mm-hmm. So uh, everyone comes to the table, we put big ideas out there, and then we come to consensus on what we want the legislation to do. Mm-hmm. Then you need folks to work and refine that bill mm-hmm. in a way that is workable mm-hmm. in the real world. And that's where... My um, skills come in just by nature of my own disposition and also my legal training as well. So are you more of an extrovert or an introvert? You mentioned disposition. Yeah. How does your disposition uh, pro- give you a propensity to be interested in the details? So I've always been um, an introvert. I kind of ended up in politics accidentally. How did that happen? So uh, I was at a big law firm and doing some work pro bono for a local environmental group. Uh, when there was a vacancy in the legislature, a midterm vacancy, and they encouraged me to put my name forward. I always viewed myself as, as you know, as staff. Mm-hmm. I always thought I'd be, you know, chief counsel to the Judiciary Committee or behind the scenes. Were you ever staff? I wasn't. I was, I was at a legal practice assuming that I was going to end up on the Hill one day. Mm-hmm. That, was my, that was my goal. You know, I, was a, I had mod, modest goals, still have modest goals. I always figured I'd end up on the Hill and work in policy from behind the curtain. Did you go straight to law school from college? I did, yeah. Okay, and then you went to law school, you became an attorney, Uh you went into a law firm, and you figured that one day you'd end up working for politicians in the Congress. Exactly. And they asked you to do some pro bono work. You did, you're working with a liberal, left-leaning organization, which happened to align with your own views. There was a vacancy, and you ended up putting your name forward, and the rest is history? Well, there's some bumps in the road there, as there always are. So this environmental organization encouraged me to put my name forward. Mm -hmm. I told them I have no idea what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. I've never run for elected office. I've never saw myself as someone who would run for elected office. And they said, uh, oh, don't worry about it. We know all this stuff. We'll take care of it. Mm -hmm. Uh, And, of course, I I lost badly. Um, And that's how politics works. But I got a taste of it, and I really liked what I saw. How old were you that first, not only when you, not on election day, yeah. how old were you at the time that the, that the environmental group asked you to put your name forward? Who I'd have to do the math, but I probably was about 25. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And then how old were you when you first became a delegate? I was, um, I had just turned 27 when I was sworn in. Okay. Yeah. 
So pretty. So you lost, and two years later, you found yourself being a delegate anyway. Well, what happened was, and, and this is a great lesson in politics, and I always try to remind myself of it and tell others. Um, when I ran that first time, that environmental organization supported me, mm-hmm. and I sought out the support of a lot of other organizations, mm-hmm. thinking that's what you were supposed to do. Now, it turns out most of those organizations ended up supporting someone else mm-hmm. who won the race. Mm-hmm. But um, it just goes to show you that... that you. You know, you never want to burn bridges. You always want to keep the lines of communication open. Mm-hmm. Because the way I was able to win the second time, just mm-hmm. a couple of years later, mm-hmm. was there was another vacancy just by happenstance. Mm-hmm. And a lot of those organizations that didn't support me the first time said, you know, you made a pretty good impression the first time. Mm-hmm. Um, we didn't support you then, but we'd like to support you now. Mm-hmm. And so keeping um, those lines of communication open in the world of politics is, I think, an important lesson. Because if someone doesn't support you now, mm-hmm. you never know they might support you next time. So there's no permanent uh, enemies, as it were. That's right. Uh, but I, you know, and of course the other part of that phrase is that there are no permanent friends. I do like to think, maybe this is terribly naive, uh, but I'm 10 years in in the legislature, and I do like to think there are permanent friends. I've made some wonderful friends mm-hmm. in Annapolis, both elected officials, advocates, lobbyists. Do you find yourself ever on an opposing side of an issue from a friend? Oh, sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, most of the colleagues um, I'm close with, we're, uh, you know, just happen to be of the same party, so we don't often find ourselves on opposite sides. But certainly there are advocates within Annapolis mm-hmm. who, um, you know, one day we're passing a bill together, yeah. and then the next day, you know, I'm trying to kill theirs or they're trying to kill mine. And it's not personal. You're able to overcome those kind of individual the one-on-one issues you try to win the game that day yeah it's never personal listen trust me there are moments where you want to make it personal and you, you know in politics there is sometimes um, just you know you, 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 there's just a sense that you should go for the jugular um, and you have to kind of get yourself back into normalcy how so, do you do that how do you calibrate yourself yeah um, the short answer is I go home at night you know um do some delegates not go home at night? Well, listen, there are plenty of great delegates who, who uh, stay in Annapolis every evening. and In the hotel. In, in the hotels or the rented houses, and, mm-hmm. and um, they're no worse off for it. I don't mean to paint with a broad brush here. But for me, um, staying centered and staying in the real world requires my going home almost every night. And now you also have a family, correct? Right. And, so, and just for our listeners who may not be familiar with Maryland geography... Uh, what kind of commute is that? So it's about an hour, hour and 15 minutes. About 40 miles between Chevy Chase, Kensington, and Annapolis. Yeah, okay. exactly. Um, so it depends on traffic and the like. Mm-hmm. But, um, but I need to see my family. Mm-hmm. Um, I need to see my family for them. But you know, in the context of our discussion, I need to see my family for me. So, you ha- so how is it? So you're balancing, and you're also an attorney. You, are you still at the? Uh, you, you were working for a firm, and right. now you're you're still working for a law firm. Yeah, actually, I have my own practice. You have your own practice yep. now, so you're balancing your own practice and the family, plus being a delegate, plus potentially other things. Sure. How is it that you are able to balance all three of those things, and why does it matter to you so much to be trying to advancing the public interest when you have so many competing priorities in your life? Well, it's not easy, and I get that question a lot. Um, the, the answer is that there is no answer. Mm-hmm. Um, you just juggle it. There's no silver bullet. Mm-hmm. There's no magic formula. And different people do it different ways. There are plenty of other uh, delegates and senators in Annapolis with families like, like uh, mine. Um, so it's less about how you do it and more about that you do it. Right. Um, and for me, just maintaining um, the professional side, the personal side, and the political side um, and, and working hard never to give short shrift, especially to the family, um, is, I think, important. Um, Do you think it influences your children in any way to see their father as a committed public servant and an elected official? Yeah, my oldest, so I have twins, and, and they're seven. I've got a three-year-old as well. The seven-year-old twins by now certainly understand that what my job is is a little bit different than most folks' jobs. Mm-hmm. Um, not better. Um, just different, and they know that you know every four years I'm up for re-election. They asked me maybe about eighteen months ago, you know, Daddy, why does Mommy have a job but you have to 
get your job over and over again yeah. and for years. I said, yeah, well, that's that's unique to my profession. Um, but so I don't really do a lot of explaining to them. I think most of it they get through osmosis, and I hope they understand what I do, why I do it. Mm-hmm. Um, and of course, we talk some, you know, because they watch the news about the federal election mm-hmm. and having them understand what they hear about at school and what they see on the news federally Mm -hmm. and then using that to analogize what I do at the state level that helps explain it for them. So we've been able to talk a little bit about how you got yourself into elected office. We haven't spoken as much yet about your motivations. Right. So other than you found that, you know, someone else believed in you and you, and you kind of liked it and then it ended up working out for you. Why is it, and you said, you know, there's some big picture issues, but you're better at the details. What is it that motivates you um, day in and day out, especially when, you know, these big issues, they come, they every once so often, it takes a long time for things to mature. What is it that drives you every day? Yeah. So uh, the constituents is is what gets me up in the morning. I mean, um, being able to serve the people you live near is a really special feeling. Um, being able to go to the grocery store and have someone come up to you and say, hey, you know, I called your office about a pothole two days ago and mm-hmm. now it's filled. Mm-hmm. Um, that feels wonderful. So I didn't go to Annapolis to fill potholes, um, <laughs> but on a daily basis, being able to fix things for folks, it, it might sound small to mm-hmm. you mm-hmm. or to our listeners here, um, but it's big to them. And being able to um, do those things is really gratifying uh, in between the big victories, you know, the marriage equalities and Mm -hmm. and death penalty repeals of the world. What keeps me going in between is these kind of small constituent casework um, items. And what is it that makes you feel so much empathy or compassion for individuals who you hitherto hadn't even known? Yeah. I think, you know, we live here in Montgomery County. It's an exceedingly large county, and mm-hmm. that's easy to forget. You and I both grew up here. It can feel small sometimes, but then you realize uh, there are over a million people in Montgomery County. And uh, I'm a big believer, as are many people in my party, in the power of government to do big things. Um, but government can't do big things if people don't trust it to do small things. And in a big county like ours, getting small things done is more problematic than it should be. And so I view myself as kind of the grease uh, or the liaison that can you know, go from problem to solution for people. And if, if you build that trust mm-hmm. on potholes, on snow plowing, mm-hmm. on the basics of government, mm-hmm. then when government comes in and wants to do something really big mm-hmm. and really important, folks trust it to do it right. Interesting. So it seems like... Uh, you, so the legislative session is one quarter of the year, right. though you're a delegate for four quarters of the year. Right. So for three of those four quarters, you're not actually in session, yet you're still doing work and you're finding that those the work that you do, that constituent service, is generally more concrete and therefore more tan- and more tangible right. for constituents and it's rewarding to get that done. It is. I mean, it kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. Um, The legislature is a workplace. And just like your listeners who go to work every day, they Mm -hmm. like the positive feedback, whether it's from their clients Mm -hmm. or from their boss. And in that, you know, I'm just like anyone else. I go to work every day and it feels good when you get positive feedback. So tell me about these constituents that you're helping so much. Your representative, you are a delegate um, from District 18. You represent 120,000 people in District 18. Who are they? Yeah. (laughs) Well, they're extremely diverse, and so it's difficult to to nail down and generalize. Um, But if I was forced to, I would say that most of my constituents um, are uh, highly educated folks Mm -hmm. who are... um, you know, middle class folks, two working parents, mm-hmm. and they're trying to do best by their children and their family. Mm-hmm. Uh, same thing I'm trying to do for my family. Mm-hmm. And so um, I see myself in them, and hopefully they see themselves in me. Mm-hmm. And we work together to kind of fix these small problems as they come up, and, and hopefully along the way fix the big problems as well. So we haven't yet talked about your legal practice. You yeah. have your own practice. What is the name of that practice? So it's just me. It's just you know. It's just Jeff Waldstriker, right. Esquire. Um, and so um, I do uh, government investigations, antitrust work, 
and the like. Do you ever do any pro bono work anymore, which is what got you kicked off on this thing? Yeah, uh, sure. Yeah, absolutely. What kind of work is that? So um, I do mostly kind of bigger size pro bono work with other firms. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so I continue to do environmental pro bono work uh -huh. um, and some um, immigration pro bono work as well. Why is it that you were originally put on an environmental pro bono case and why is it not only do you continue to do it, but yeah. that environmental group that you mentioned before yeah. was so interested in having you run. What do you think made, well, not, not only as much what attracted them to you, clearly you had some interest in the issue that they were interested in, but what really initially interests you in environmental issues? You could be a pro bono lawyer in, in, a, in myriad different subject matters, but, yeah. but this is something that matters to you. Um, it does, and um, and the challenge matters, right? So, um, so I often do pro bono work outside of my normal area of practice. What is, and your normal area is more financial transact, or what? Will you yeah, say? government investigations, okay. antitrust, FCPA, okay. um, things along that line. So, well, first of all, there's not a lot of pro bono work to be had in that area. <laughs> um, but more importantly, when you do something um, for your profession, sometimes it's nice to stretch yourself and try to try to. Um, do other areas of law in my case and so um, and so you know I don't have practice environmental law um, but it's always exciting when I get to do a little bit of it mm -hmm. especially for causes that I believe in yeah is there anything in particular about env the environment in general that drives you to focus on that area or you have you all have, is yeah. it just is it do you have a particular interest well um, I you know I don't I don't know I think part of it is um, you know, I'm one of the younger representatives in Annapolis, and, mm -hmm. and you know, my generation, we just grew up with a strong environmental awareness. Huh. Um, but when you talk about environmentalism, you realize very quickly that it can get highly technical, huh. and it can get um, just very difficult procedurally. Yeah. And so um, that can be very intimidating, and so that can be intimidating whether it's you know practicing law or mm -hmm. trying to legislate in the area. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I just try to push through that uh -huh. and push through my own fear of the unknown. And so that's why that area of law and legislating on environmentalism is exciting for now, me. Now, th there is a committee in the Maryland House of Delegates pertaining to the environment, right? Transportation and sure. environment. Yep. And you're not on that. You're on economic matters. Right. Did you have any say in that? And if, if so or if not, why, why are you not on that committee that interests you? Or oh, and, then, and then the flip side is... The area of law that you do practice in right. with the antitrust, is that an area that is covered by your current committee assignment? Okay, great question. Yeah. So in answer to the first, um, the speaker makes all the committee assignments. Mm -hmm. And so um, and so, I'm fortunate that I'm on the committee I want to be on. I asked to switch to economic matters, and I love the From? subject, Mary. I, I was on the Judiciary Committee. Okay. Now, you probably know this, but, but perhaps your list listeners may not. Um, Maryland's the only state in the union where folks sit on only one committee. Mm -hmm. So it encourages specialization um, and you get to create a sense of camaraderie with your committee mates. Mm -hmm. So I think folks, when they think of committees, they think of the Hill. Mm -hmm. They often think of these hearings where only a quarter of the members are there. Mm -hmm. In Annapolis, because you only have one committee, mm -hmm. almost everyone's there and almost everyone's there every day. Mm -hmm. um, and so... Um, you can't always, you know, all the subject areas you care about aren't within one committee. So I care deeply about the environment, mm. uh, but I'm not on the environment committee. So I, you still would introduce legislation pertaining to the environment, even though it's not going through your own committee. That's right. Yeah. And if I had something um, that was, as we say, a heavy lift, I'd mm -hmm. probably give it to one of my colleagues who's on the environment committee. Mm -hmm. It's always for big stuff, for real big, difficult stuff. It's always easier to pass from a member of that committee. So you would let them be the primary sponsor, and mm -hmm. then you would be a co-sponsor? Right. Or exactly. would you leave your name off it entirely and just try to push in the background? Well, you can do it either way, uh -huh. um, but usually I'd be a co-sponsor. So it would be your idea, your big thing, but you'd let someone else run with it within their own committee and kind of get more of the credit for it in exchange for increasing the likelihood it actually becomes law and helps the people of the state. Right. And it all comes around. I mean, you know... if. Certainly no one, you know, is too worried about who gets credit for things. But even if that person gets credit, eventually they're going to have a bill in my committee that they right. have an idea for, and they'll come to me to reciprocate. Sure. So uh, let's see here. So you're, um, 
let's talk a little bit about some of the and and then, oh yeah we didn't say economic matters you're on economic matters now mm-hmm. and you wanted to be on it because you said it is more of your subject expertise well it was a couple of reasons so I was on judiciary for eight years, Mm -hmm. and uh, like we talked about earlier, we had some really big victories that came through my committee, and that I was proud to work on very intimately. So that's um, the gun safety bill. Mm -hmm. It's got one of the toughest gun safety bills in the nation. It was the death penalty repeal, Mm -hmm. um, which I was very proud to be a part of, and it was marriage equality. Mm -hmm. And um, while I was there, I also pushed a lot of criminal justice reform issues forward. So three big wins and one partial victory, I would call it. Mm -hmm. And at that point, I felt like I had kind of done all I had come to do on the Judiciary Committee. So you had a few boxes you wanted to check. You had checked them all. You were ready to kind of broaden your horizon. Exactly. And and to come across a new challenge. So economic matters deals with issues of economic justice, Mm -hmm. uh, deals with labor regulation, Mm -hmm. deals with insurance law and consumer protection. Mm -hmm. A lot of exciting stuff that I didn't really have my hands in when I was on the Judiciary Committee, and I wanted to start anew and work on a lot of those issues. And have you been able to so far in the last two years? Yep, yep, absolutely. So last year we passed a very historic um, equal pay for equal work law, Mm -hmm. and um, it, it's a great bill. Is that uh, gender parity? Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Exactly. Um, but the nuance was difficult. So, mm-hmm. you know. And that's your wheelhouse right there. Right. Right. So I was on the, the work group. So we have a, a, an important idea, equal pay for equal work. Mm-hmm. But how you get that down on paper in mm-hmm. a way that um, fulfills the values um, that you're trying to fulfill, moves the ball forward, um, but is flexible enough and workable enough for businesses that they feel like... Um, that, that it's a workable solution for the problem we're trying to solve. And, and that's when I was in the mix. And so we'll also be looking at issues related to paid sick leave mm-hmm. and um, at some point raising the minimum wage again. That all comes to my committee. So as we near the end of this podcast, um, I'd like to ask you a final question, which is to reflect upon your time in the legislature, your time doing pro bono work, uh, basically your time as a public servant. Yeah. And I'd like to ask you to take a moment to reflect audibly so our listeners can hear really what motivates you, which we've touched on a little bit before, but yeah. what you'd hope your legacy would be. Presume that you continue on in this vein for X number of years into the future. Right. And then presume at some point you stop. Could be 200 years from now. But uh, at some yeah. point... What is it you want to be remembered by? So what is your what is your motivation been? And then what will you have accomplished? When someone says Jeff Waldstriker a hundred years from now, what what will they what will you hope they will be saying about you? Yeah, well, that's a good question. Well, first I hope they're not saying there's I hope they're not starting with the political, right? The most important thing for me in life right now is to be a good husband and a good dad. Hmm. And hopefully that's the first thing they say um, when I leave this earth. He was a good husband and he was a good yeah, that's my number one priority, and um, and that's the most important to me. Um, in the legislature, you know, I hope my legacy um, is a combination of things, mm-hmm. uh, much of which we've discussed. I hope people think of me as a public servant first and foremost. Um, that uh, what I was doing, um, well, how I was motivated, was always towards the people I represent, mm-hmm. um, and never for personal gain or personal aggrandizement. Um, mm-hmm. You know, which which happens in politics, unfortunately, sometimes. And in terms of the issues I work on, hopefully, people will say, "Listen, he had a major part to play when it came to civil liberties and civil rights. Um, he had a major part to play when it came to economic justice mm-hmm. in Maryland. And while he was there, he didn't just sit back and relax. You know, he put his nose to the grindstone and made it happen." So that has been episode ninety-five of Public Interest Podcast. Uh, where we interview politicians, activists, advocates, and others who seek to improve the state of the world um, with Delegate Jeff Waldstriker. Um, Jeff speaks about uh, seeking to uh, improve the world through both daily interactions and presenting concrete solutions to concrete problems facing his constituents, but also sees the world more holistically. He wishes to be remembered as a as a, as a man who, you know, was a, was a family man with uh, a loving, loving father and a loving husband. 
and um, and the legislative component component of his public service is just one part of, of many ways in which Jeff sees himself as serving uh, his community. It's rewarding for him to see himself uh, go about the community and having really had an impact for his constituents. And uh, when he has definitely made an influence on a small level, um, concretely for his constituents, and he pairs that with the big influence that he can make for all six million Marylanders when he passes impactful progressive legislation, for Jeff, that's what makes all the difference. So thank you again for joining us, Jeff. Thank you, Jordan. And this has been Public Interest Podcast. Uh, Thank you for listening.